In the two videos so far this week, I've talked about the problem of tangent lines and defined the derivative as a limit. Now I actually want to calculate. Using the limit definition directly to calculate derivatives is pretty miserable. This is a general theme in mathematics. Often the good, logical, rigorous definition is terrible for actual calculation. So mathematicians do a lot of work to find other ways to calculate. I want to build a whole set of techniques for calculating derivatives. This will take the next two videos for this week, as well as some of the videos for the following week. I need to establish a bunch of known derivatives and a bunch of rules for derivatives for various types of functions. All of these rules have formal proofs, but formal proofs are really not the focus of this class, so I'll just state most of them without justification. The base derivatives and the rules are all on the reference materials posted on the Moodle page, and I encourage you to have those references on hand while working on the activities and the assignments. They are very useful. Let me start with some basic derivatives. First, what is the derivative of a constant function? Well, the derivative is a rate of change, and a constant doesn't change, therefore its derivative is zero. A constant function has a graph which is a horizontal line, and a horizontal line has slope zero, so that matches up as well. What is the derivative of a linear function? A linear function is a straight line with a slope, and the derivative is the slope, so in the function mx plus b, the constant m is the slope, so the derivative must be this number m, which is constant over the whole line. What are the derivatives of the basic trig functions? Well, the sine wave oscillates up and down, so its rate of change is likewise oscillating, sometimes increasing and sometimes decreasing. And it turns out that the rate of change of sine is perfectly captured by the other trig function, cosine. And likewise, the rate of change of cosine is perfectly captured by the negative of the sine function. Next, let me talk about exponential functions. These are important enough that I want to spend some time in understanding these derivatives. Derivatives are slopes of tangent lines, so let me look at the shapes of exponential graphs. Here are four exponential functions with different bases. The larger the base, the faster the exponential grows. 5 squared is larger than 4 squared, which is larger than 3 squared, and so on. However, all exponential functions, regardless of base, go through the point 0, 1. Why, why is this? Well, if you put x equals 0 into any of these, you get 1. 5 to the 0 is 1, and so is 4 to the 0, and so is 3 to the 0, and so on. So there's something interesting going on at the point 0, 1. Lodge that fact in your memory for a moment while I move on to the limit definitions. Here is the limit definition for the derivative applied to an exponential function with arbitrary base a. I take the limit of f of x, which is now a, or f of x plus h, which is a to the x plus h, minus f of x, which is a to the x, and that's over h in the limit as h goes to zero. Now I can do some algebra with the exponent. The sum of exponents is the same as the product of the bases, but then I can factor a to the x out of the entire numerator. Now the limit cares about h. The limit doesn't actually care at all about x a to the x can come out of the limit, it is a constant as far as the limit is concerned. What I have left is this limit. This looks very much like what I started with. In fact, this limit I'm left with is precisely the derivative, but just with x set to 0. It is the slope of the graph at this point 0, 1, the point that all the exponentials have in common. So what is the derivative of an exponential function? It is the same function multiplied by some constant, and that constant is exactly the slope of that function going through the point 0, 1. I can see these slopes in the examples I used before. The faster exponentials have steeper slopes, and the slower exponentials have shallower slopes. Somewhere in there, there should be a special base where the slope at 0, 1 is exactly 1. The base that does this is the special number e roughly 2.7. Since it has a slope 1 at 0, 1, the derivative of an exponential multiplied by this slope is just multiplied by 1, and that doesn't do anything, so the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. The exponential base e is its own derivative. Its value 
and its rate of change are the same, and it is, it is the unique function which has this property. I said early in the, earlier in the course that I would justify the base E and its importance. This is the justification. Having a function which is its own derivative is extremely convenient. Using e to the x just makes sense in calculus. To finish off the exponentials, what is this constant for other bases? What is the slope through the point 0, 1? Well, it turns out it is the natural logarithm of the base. And again, this shows how base e is the base that makes the most sense for calculus. This is the general rule to differentiate an exponential. You multiply by the natural log logarithm of the base. Exponential functions have the variable in the exponent, but polynomials and roots have the variable in the base. I want to differentiate these as well. Here, I'm not going to give the justification, I'm just going to give the result. The derivative of x to the n for any n not equal to 0, including fractions, is n times x to the n minus 1. The old exponent comes down, becomes multiplied in front, and the new exponent is 1 less. This is called the power rule. I already used the term linearity for limits. Limits were linear because they split up over addition and subtraction, and I could pull a constant out of the limit. The same is true for derivatives. The derivative of a sum or a difference is the sum or the difference of the derivatives, and a constant can be pulled out. The power rule and linearity lets me do all polynomial derivatives, and polynomials are the best place to demonstrate both of these rules, the power rule and linearity. So let me do an example here. I want to differentiate the quadratic x squared minus 3x minus 4. A polynomial is put together by addition and subtraction. Linearity says I can split up derivatives over addition and subtraction. So this derivative becomes three derivatives, one for each piece between the subtractions. Then linearity says I can pull out constants. This means the three in the middle derivative can come out of the derivative. Now I do all three derivatives. The first is a power rule. The power rule for n equals two gives two times x to the two minus one, which is x to the one, which is just x. The old exponent comes down in front, and the new exponent is 1 less. The derivative of x is 1, since this is a straight line with slope 1, and the derivative of a constant is 0. Altogether, the derivative of the quadratic is 2x minus 3. The expression 2x minus 3 measures the rate of change of the quadratic x squared minus 3x minus 4 at all points x. Notice that the degree of the polynomial has decreased. Since the power rule drops degrees by 1, derivatives of polynomials will always decrease their total degree by 1. Let me do one more polynomial example. Here is a degree 3 polynomial. I'll start with linearity, pulling this apart into four derivatives. Then I'll pull out the constants 7, 9, and 14. The resulting derivatives are all power rule derivatives or known derivatives x cubed becomes 3x squared, the old exponent comes down in front, and the new exponent is 1 less. x squared becomes 2x, derivative of x is 1, and the derivative of a constant is 0. Simplifying, I get the quadratic 21x squared plus 18x minus 14. This quadratic measures the slope of the original cubic at all of its points.